this is a debate between Christopher Hitchens and Stephen Fry. They're on one team. And the Catholic Church. There's a woman that represents a Catholic Church, the nunnery maybe. And then there's, an, I think, a Nigerian guy. That re- I think he's like an archbishop or something. He's one of the people who could feasibly be in line to be pope. He's pretty high up there. But, you know, he's not that close to being the pope. He's just like in that kind of hierarchy. Anyways, uh, they have a debate with Christopher Hitchens, the Catholic Church does, on whether or not the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. I believe that was the proposition. And, oh, my God, dude, this is a fascinating debate. I've seen it multiple times. Been a while since I've watched it, but it's worth a watch. So I wanted to listen, see what they had to say for themselves. And while we listen, we're going to play a game in the background. Right now I'm playing um, Breath of the Wild 2. I'm just kind of grinding, you know, nothing special. Let's give this a listen. Um, I skipped the the archbishop, I think is what he is. I skipped his opening statement because he doesn't speak English as a first language. It's a little hard to understand. Not a hit against him. I just, you know, it, it's an older video, and it, it's kind of difficult to pick up on what he's saying. Uh, we will listen to his answers, but uh, we're just going to just jump. I'm sorry. We're just going to jump straight to Christopher Hitchens. I think he goes next. So is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world? Let's give this a listen. Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. Christopher Hitchens is uh, British by origin, but he has spent most of his working life in the United States. He- Christopher Hitchens, I don't know if you know him, but he, he died of cancer a while back. And he was kind of conservative a little bit. I think he was in favor of the Iraq War, for example, which is ass backwards to me there's just no good reason to be in favor of that but whatever you know he's a little bit conservative on the conservative side but overall uh, he was a fantastic dude fantastic dude and he left behind a fantastic legacy um he fought for he fought against religious extremism in his life and he was a little bit of a contrarian sometimes he said some things that were kind of dumb uh, for lack of a better term, but he, when he hit on some issues, he really hit on those issues, and he did a really, really good job. So, anyways, uh, let's let's hear what he has to say. Oh, and Stephen Fry is his debate partner. Stephen Fry is awesome. He's gay. If you're unfamiliar, that comes up later in the debate. That's why I mention it. All right, let's give this a listen. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator. Particularly well known for his. Um trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. He works on Vanity Fair magazine where he memorably wrote uh, a rather a less than complimentary profile, I would have to say, Christopher, of uh, the late Mother Teresa. Yeah, I actually read that book. Uh, Christopher Hitchens wrote a book about Mother Teresa and how she's actually terrible. She's not a good person at all. She did some really bad stuff. And th- there's... Heavy speculation with pretty good evidence, very good evidence, in fact, that she didn't believe anything that she talked about by the end of her life. Like, she thought the Catholic Church was full of it. She didn't even really believe in God, you know, fascinatingly. Anyways, yeah, that's neither here nor there. Uh, It was an interesting book. Again, I don't think Mother Teresa was a bad person necessarily, um, but she certainly did some very ethically questionable things. Absolutely. Quick interjection. I won't take long. I just wanted to tell you guys, YouTube's algorithm operates off of a few factors. Watch time, whether or not you subscribe, and whether or not you like something. So if you really want to help my channel, I would appreciate it if you guys watch the video to the end. If you don't watch it to the end, just watch a little bit longer than you would have otherwise. I would appreciate that very much. All right, let's get back to the video. Uh, so, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your t- Ooh, there are rumblings. People don't like, I mean, the Catholic Church and people invo- uh, associated with it don't like hearing Mother Teresa may not have been perfect. Time starts now. <clears throat> Please make your way to the podium. Wait, his time starts before he's even up there? Are you kidding me?
Well, Your Grace, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, and Zainab, who did something that I almost never have had experienced before, uh, paid a compliment to my shirt before we came on tonight. <laughs> So I was able to return by pointing to hers, which you, you're feasting your eyes on now, and saying, I once saw Norman St. John Stevens, now Lord Stevens of Forley, wearing a shirt just like that on the television. <laughs> and he was asked by his interviewer, gosh, what a lovely shirt, where did you get it? And Stevens said, do you really like it? He said, I, I call it sort of crushed cardinal. <laughs> crushed cardinal? I, I, I don't think I fully understand, but I think it's... Uh, purple joke being a royal color. I'm not, I'm not super sure. <laughs> Maybe somebody in the comments can elaborate. I might add, in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire soiree, that the- This dude is so eloquent. Everything that he says is, like, on point. Uh, how often do you hear the word soiree used, honestly? It means party, basically. Like, a uh, tea-sipping soiree is another way of saying a tea party and I, or just a party in general. And God, I, I love the term tea sipping soiree. It's like one of my favorite terms ever. I might add in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire- I, I might add in, in the form of brotherhood, fraternity. A soiree, that the mere existence of Lord Steve of Foley is testimony to the breadth of the church. Um, <laughs> The mere existence of the guy is a testament to how big the church is, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure who they're even referring to here. Now, I'm sorry, though, to have to begin by disagreeing with His Grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Absolutely. You cannot claim the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world without starting out apologizing for the things that they've done. 100% agree with Hitchens here. You know, the thing that Hitchens is probably going to touch on in a second, I will touch on now. The Catholic Church famously, you know, had a basically a pet scandal, right? Now, let me tell you something that a lot of people don't want to acknowledge, they, they don't want to talk about, they don't want to, they just want to push it into a corner. Let me bring it up and point it right in your face and make it public. Pedophilia is a part of society, a big part. As far as we can tell, it's, it's hard to know for sure. Uh, estimates have it as somewhere around 4% of the population. 4%. Every demographic of people, every group, has some percentage of people like that in it. Every single group. Republicans, Democrats, uh, people on the left or the right, uh, people who are, you know, Catholic, people who are Jehovah's Witness, people who are Mormon, whatever. Every demographic. Even atheists have roughly 4% people like that. That's a part, that's a fact of life. That's a part of society. Now, the question is, when you find this problem in your little world, in your space, in your existence, how do you handle it? That's, that's the million dollar question here. How do you deal with it when you find out that there is somebody that's taking advantage of kids? How did Jehovah's Witnesses handle it? They lied about it, they covered it up, they got policies put in place that protected these people from prosecution. You know why? Because they thought that having the world find out that they had these people in their ranks, they thought ha you know, people finding out about that would reproach Jehovah's name, bring reproach on Jehovah's name. It would make them look bad, basically. They were afraid they were going to look bad if people found out that there was this problem in their organization. And it's the same with the Catholic Church, the exact same problem. So they covered it up. The Catholic Church didn't just have institutional policies that enabled it, made it easier for these people to exist. The Catholic Church 
knew this was happening in their ranks, knew that people were doing this to children, were aware of exactly who it was. And instead of turning them over for prosecution, what did the Catholic Church do? Moved them from parish to parish, protected them, lied for them. That's what the Catholic Church did. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses did effectively, too. They instituted policies that would protect their organization. And if that meant letting these people go free and and continue to offend within their ranks, okay. That's how it is, as long as their organization's protected. That's what the Catholic Church has to apologize for. I don't give a shit that there are people in their ranks that are like that. I want you to take care of it when it happens. I want you to protect the people you've sworn to protect. That's what I want. In every instance, the Mormon Church, the Catholic Church, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, all of them, at every turn, have protected their own public image and allowed these people to continue abusing kids. That is my problem. Anyways, that's what Hitchens is probably about to bring up, and he is 100% correct that the Archbishop should start out with an apology for that. Did the Catholic Church... Was this found out about the Catholic Church that they were moving them from parish to parish because they came out and admitted it and apologized for it? No, of course not. They were caught. There Has there ever been an apology for what the Catholic Church did protecting these people from prosecution? I doubt it. Anyway, let's keep listening. Heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now, you might ask... Yeah, they should... It, heartfelt requests for forgiveness. That's what they should be requesting here. Are they? Of course they're not. Like they give a shit. What they give a shit about is their public image. It's what they've always cared about. All of these religious organizations. Catholic Church and, and Jehovah's Witnesses and everybody. They give a shit about their public image. You're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee millennium year of 2000, the Vatican spoke... Is that when this debate took place 2000 it's in uh 16 9 aspect ratio so 4 3 was the standard at the time it seems to me like this was probably 2006 i i if i had to guess i would say it's 2006 when this came out but i don't know for sure spokesman bishop piero marini said explaining a whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope that was supposed to cover the entire history of the church in its jubilee year, that I'll quote uh, Bishop Marini directly, he said, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I th so he says, yeah, we've, we've messed up a lot, so we're going to have to summarize. We're going to summarize all of the wrongdoings that we've done. That's basically what he said. I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary, too. But I think he said just about the least of it. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America. And that followed a whole series of preceding apologies, or apologies, I would say, of a kind, made by the late Pope John Paul, who, it troubles me not at all to say, was a very impressive and serious human being. Um, it followed no less than 94, 94 count them, uh, public recognitions on his part of appalling crime and error and cruelty and stupidity and offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from, I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini, the African slave trade apologized for in 1995. 
Yeah, uh, the apologies came too late and were not given by the people who perpetrated the wrongs. That's really the problem here, in my opinion. I don't give a shit if Pope... Uh, who, the, who did he mention? Like Bishop Marini. Bishop, wait, hang on. Offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from, I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini, the African slave trade apologized for in 1995. I don't know who apologized for that in 1995. It wasn't the guy who did it. I don't give a shit about his apology. I give a shit about the apology of the guy that did it, that actually contributed, that helped, that made it easier for people to take advantage of the ones around them. That's what I care about. And guess what? They never faced accountability. Not one of them. Not one of these popes who shuttled these child abusers from parish to parish faced accountability. Not one of these popes that contributed to the African slave trade. Not one of the popes that perpetrated the crusades, that created the propaganda ministry. Yeah, that's where the term comes from. The propaganda was a Catholic church group of people who were uh, who existed solely to spread the word of the Catholic church, to spread the, the thing that they wanted spread, the propaganda. Not one of the people who did any of that shit apologized for it. I don't give a shit about the 95 apology for the African slave trade. I don't care. Uh, the, the Catholic Church is a force for evil. Not just is it not a force for good, it is actively damaging to society. The admission that Galileo was right <laughs> about the relationship between the sun and the earth and other orbs. That's funny to look back on now. But they persecuted that dude. Didn't they have him killed? Galileo? He's a scientist that came to the conclusion that the, the universe did not revolve around the earth. The earth revolved around the sun. This is a scientific conclusion he came to. And didn't they have him killed for that? Because they viewed it as like anti-God or some other shit? Yeah, it's funny to look back on now. Wasn't very funny to Galileo. The Catholic Church, since day one, has been a force for evil in the world. I'm sorry. Force for evil. Which came in 1992, one might add, and no, I won't say, it's too easy to say better late than never. Here, I said it. <laughs> to violence and torture, legalized torture. Torture was legalized and institutionalized by the Roman pontiff during the Counter-Reformation. That came in 1995. Um, and... Lots of apologies in, 90, in the 90s, apparently. 92, 95, 95. Uh, for things that happened uh, a thousand years ago or 500 years ago, in some cases, 200 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I don't don't even bother at this point. Just acknowledge that this happened and that the Catholic Church is responsible for it and name the people that didn't face accountability. And I'm happy. And take steps to guarantee this will never happen again, ever. But did they do, do even that? That's the bare minimum, in my opinion. Of course they didn't. Catalina Gearbox says, once you go woke, you can't go broke. Appreciate the uh, the bits there. Uh, yeah, there's a right wing saying, go woke, go broke. What happened to that anti-cancel culture stuff? I guess they just forgot about it. That was fast. For silence during Hitler's final solution, or Shoah, as well as in 1999 coming in just under the Millennium Jubilee wire, an apology for the burning alive in the main square of Prague of the great Czech Protestant Jan Hus. Um, since I'm not familiar with that one, but if they were apologizing for it, you can bet it was disgusting and ugly and evil. It's that big fiesta of forgiveness that uh, began in, uh, well, culminated, I might say, in 2000. Fiesta of forgiveness, fiesta of asking for it. The papacy is also asked to be forgiven for the sack of Constantinople and the massacre of Byzantine Christianity 
in April 1204 as part of the Fourth Crusade. The so they apologize, or they haven't apologized for these things. Is that what he's saying? He's giving us a list of stuff that the Catholic Church should have apologized for but haven't yet, which is the Fourth Crusade. Anathema on all Eastern Orthodox Christians as unbelievers, heretics, and people dwelling outside the health of the Church was lifted only in 1964. I call your attention to that. He also expressed sorrow about the murder and forced conversion of Serbian Orthodox Christians in the Balkans during the Second World War. Okay, so I guess these are still things they apologized for. And it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth yeah this is part of that whole child abuse thing that i was talking about the catholic church is as guilty as it gets for that one all the way to the very top it the the whole thing the whole scheme that was going on in the catholic church to take advantage of children went all the way to the top all the way to the pope uh, to my knowledge, even the Pope himself was aware of what was happening and was allowing it. I can't say if he was taking part or not, because I don't remember. It's been a while since I've looked into this. But he was aware of it, and he allowed it to take place. That's, I'm sorry, man, that's fucking disgusting. Now, it's not the same Pope that we've got today. That Pope is, uh, I think he retired which is one of the only popes that ever actually retired from his position rather than died. Usually they die in their position rather than retire. But um, this pope that we've currently got, he's not fantastic. I, he could be worse, but yeah, I don't know, whatever. I mean, he's he's expressed some interesting stuff. I think he said he opened it up so that evolution is like an acceptable thing for people to accept in the Catholic Church. Um, and, and among other things, like he's done some good things and he's done some bad things. So I forget what the name of this Pope is currently now. From Ireland to Australia. And I'm pleased to see that due reconsideration is now being given and may in fact have been given to the hellish, I choose the word carefully, doctrine of limbo. Saint right, right. Limbo. If you're not Catholic, you're unfamiliar. The doctrine of limbo is where you you basically like you you don't know if you're going to heaven or not. And it's kind of like hell because you're basically stuck there until it's decided if you get to go to heaven and you know, you're you're eating yourself alive with guilt and fear and hatred and everything until you find out. But but for a small fee, you can pay a priest to pray your limbo-laden relative into heaven for a small fee. All you got to do is give us $10,000 or whatever. This is how it operated. I'm not joking. Back a while back. Again, I think he's listing things the Catholic Church apologized for forever ago. And if you had enough money, you could pay for an army of priests to stand at a shrine and pray you all the way up to the table of God. Talk about predatory, dude. Catholic Church has been predatory since day one. And yeah, you can say, oh, that's all in the past, all you want. But no, it's not. There's still disgusting, evil stuff happening in the world, thanks to the Catholic Church today, such as discouraging people from using condoms, blaming AIDS on certain groups of people, denying it exists, all kinds of stuff happening even today that's unforgivable and disgusting. And either way, the proposition is, is the Catholic Church a force for good? The answer is no. It's a force for evil. That's obvious. Augustine's uh, cruel and stupid disposal problem solution to a non-existent problem that is to say, the destination of the souls of unbaptized children. Talking about limbo now. Up until if you weren't baptized as a child, you're in limbo. Until now, Catholic parents have been taught that's where their unbaptized children went, a form of torture that's sometimes worse than the physical. Now it seems that this piece of Augustinian sadism is undergoing reconsideration 
as well. But remember, this is from a church that, on the whole, cannot err. Right. Uh, on the whole, the church is perfect. It can't be in error. The Pope is God's mouthpiece on earth, supposedly. And I guess God's mouthpiece on earth wanted to take part in a scheme to abuse young boys. Okay, I didn't know that God stood for that, but now I know, I suppose, huh? We still await a more direct admission. For example, I would give some suggestions of my own while we're at it. I would like them to take back the Concordat made with Adolf Hitler, the first treaty he ever signed, giving the church a monopoly over education in Germany in exchange for the dis dissolution of the Catholic Center Party to give the Nazi Party a clear run. I'd have apologized for the Lateran Pact with Mussolini, myself, also the first treaty ever signed by that fascist dictator. I would also think I'd want to reconsider the fact that Father Tizo, head of the Nazi puppet state in Slovakia, was a priest in holy orders. That the Croatian fascist puppet state, the Ustasha state of Anti Pavlic, was also operating under full clerical protection and disguise, as was the regime of General Franco and the dictator Antonio Salazar. I.e., there were a ton of religious figures, a ton of Catholic priests that were affiliated with and assisting the Nazi party. Now, near the end of the war, in the 40s, the war, well, the war didn't really officially start until I'm not exactly sure when, but the whole Nazi party really started its rise in 1932. And, you know, there's a long timeline, 1933, 34, 35. It, it was ramping up that entire time. You know, they cordoned Jews off into ghettos and things like that. Um, all along the timeline, you can find examples of the Catholic Church cooperating with the Nazi party. But eventually, Hitler realized that he wanted a perfectly unified Germany, which kind of meant getting rid of the Catholic Church. That was late in the war, to my knowledge. That was like way, way, way late in the war. That's when it was almost over in the 40s, I believe. And that's when the Catholic Church publicly came out against the Nazi Party and started protecting Jews and things like that. When they realized that, you know, Hitler, there's no way that they could work with Hitler. He was just going to fight them every step of the way. So they just had to you know, stand up against him, basically. That's what, that's what that was all about. Now, there was a specific day that the Catholic Church passed out a, uh, famously, passed out a little pamphlet that was to be read in every Catholic Church on the exact same day at the exact same moment in Germany. That was basically condemning Hitler and saying that he what he's doing is wrong and blah, blah, blah. Near the end of the war. Again, Catholic Church cooperated for a long, long time up until they realized that Hitler had other plans for them. He wanted people to be a part of his church, you know, the church in Germany. Not a part of the Catholic Church because it was uh, like a, an unknown value it was it was a a wild card that hitler couldn't control so he was doing everything he could to kind of destroy the power of the catholic church and they didn't take kindly to that so it ended badly for hitler and the catholic church uh, between the two of them but you can bet your bottom dollar the catholic church sure as hell cooperated with hitler for a good long time before they parted ways and had a problem with each other I'd also want, I really think I would beg forgiveness for this, I don't think the German church should have asked Hitler's birthday to be celebrated from the pulpit every year until he died. Again, that, for that, you know, that is one example of the way in which the Catholic church put a puff in Hitler's petticoat to stay on his good side, celebrate his birthday every year, which, by the way, is 420. You may not have known that or been, you know, I'm sorry if I ruined 420 for you. But yeah, Hitler's birthday is 420. And the apparent, like the Catholic Church celebrated his birthday until the day he died. Because they wanted to please him. They wanted to make him happy. They wanted to make sure 
that they were in good with him and they, you know, could work with him or, or control him to some degree or continue keeping like continue operating in the country, basically. Disgusting. Simply disgusting. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic charities. But I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the vicar of Christ on earth, says of Indians, of the Indians who were massacred in the course of conversion in Brazil, after the apology had been made to them, he said, nonetheless, it must be remembered that before we came to convert them, they were silently awaiting the arrival of the church. I just wow, so he massacred Indians when he got there. And in, like, I guess, what, in the apology, he said they were silently awaiting us to convert to Catholicism. Jesus Christ, dude. I don't think that's a very genuine kind of apology to you. In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry, they've already had that. <laughs> exactly, they've already had that. They've already had the most loving pastoral care, and that's why we are in the situation that we're in right now. Because the Catholic priests were taking advantage of their position. They can no longer be trusted to care for children. And guess what? Catholic priests, in fact, anybody of any denomination, of any religion at all, is not a counselor. They are not trained in psychology and they should not be giving psychology advice. They should not be acting as a therapist for anybody. They have no idea what they're talking about. And to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. There, yeah, agreed. The fact that you even said that tells me that you, your apology was empty and meaningless. That's the point here. When I say child abuse was institutional, how dare I say so? How can I prove it? How can I prove such a thing? Well, I'll ask, the, I'll ask His Grace. And I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is... Yeah, uh, Anne Whittacombe is the other person in the debate, and she was an MP in uh, Congress. So is, I'm sorry, in the Congress equivalent of the UK. An MP is a member of parliament. That's what it stands for, I believe. Um, extremely influential person in UK government, I believe, is, is what she is. And she's apparently also Catholic. I didn't realize that. So anyway, uh, she decided to take up the charge of defending the catholic church which is honestly a losing battle like the catholic church is just objectively fucking terrible i'm sorry whether you're atheist or religious or what i'm sorry man e how if you're catholic you have to at least admit that the catholic church has done some real ugly shit over the years right I mean, Christopher Hitchens just barely touched on some of it, truthfully. Ask his grace, and I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion... I believe that the guy that he's talking about right now, where is... Bernard, what was his name? His resignation was indignant. Hold on. Now, where is he? And I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is I believe that that is one specific and particularly famous case of the Catholic Church basically moving somebody who took advantage of children from parish to parish 
to move him out of the jurisdictions and protect him from prosecution. I Don't quote me on that, but I think that's what he's referring to now. So the question is, where is he now? Where is he? Is he ever going to face accountability for what he did? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion and protection and covering up and uh, apology for and defense of uh, people whose crimes against children are too revolting to specify. And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. Right, he was moved out of the jurisdiction of Massachusetts intentionally. You know, I don't know if, you, if you're aware, maybe you're Canadian, maybe you're from the UK, you don't know how the US system works, so let me just kind of explain. Different states have the option, if they so choose, of extraditing criminals, but it costs money. So it costs money to move somebody, like a criminal, from this place to that place. It costs a lot of money to transport them, to put them in the back of a van, to get the van, to cuff them and get officers together to... Uh, you know, act as guards and m drive, you know, the gas money and the food that it takes and everything. Drive this prisoner all the way from, I don't know, Georgia to Connecticut, for example, whatever. Drive them all the way there. T it costs money to extradite. Some states refuse to extradite. Like, they refuse to cooperate with other states because it costs too much money and all that other stuff. Unfortunately, if it's a localized crime and the warrant was filed in another state, if you move to a different state, you're you're usually safe. You're, you can be safe in some cases. So, the Catholic Church, no matter how heinous the crime, the Catholic Church moved people these priests who it was objectively proven took advantage of their position to abuse children they moved these people to areas to parishes in states that did not have extradition agreements with other states to my knowledge georgia and florida don't have an extradition agreement with any other states or, or with very few states. So they move them from, you know, uh, Connecticut or, or Massachusetts in this case or whatever. They move them from there all the way to Georgia, to a Georgia parish. And boom, just like that, they're safe from prosecution. It's, it just, it, it doesn't get more disgusting than that, dude. On, like I said before, every demographic of people, every group, Every group has this problem, okay? Every demographic of people on planet Earth has an issue where some of their people are like this. When you find out about it, how do you handle it? How do you deal with it? Do you worry it's going to bring reproach? on Jehovah's name or God's name or whatever? Or do you just help the victims or the survivors more accurately? You see, do you do the right thing or do you do, try to protect your own ass? Catholic Church has historically, consistently protected their own ass in every situation. Truly disgusting stuff, man. He's the supreme vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, personally appointed by the... All right, let me step back here. So the question was, where is this guy that was in Massachusetts that I believe was charged with abusing children? And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. He's the supreme vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. Oh, wow. They moved him to a completely different country. That's fascinating in its own right, isn't it? Not only did they move him to another state, it was a different country entirely. They really didn't want him prosecuted. Personally appointed by the Pope to that as well as many other important sinecures. And in 2005, this man, 
a fugitive from justice and from, and from complicity in the filthiest crime that it's possible for a human being to imagine was one of those voting in conclave to decide who the next vicar of Christ on earth will be. I don't know. I think, I think I'd like to hear a bit more shame about this. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to hear an apology for some of this stuff. Like I said before, though, honestly, like, look, I'm just going to be, I'm going to keep it 100 with you guys. I couldn't possibly give less of a shit if some random jagoff apologizes for something some other jagoff did. I could not possibly care less. You know what I care about? I care about that Jagoff facing accountability for what he did. And he never will. He'll never face accountability for that. You know why? Because the Catholic Church made sure of that. They moved him completely out of the country. All the way from Massachusetts in the United States to Rome and kept him in a position of authority. No fucking joke, people. I'd like to see a bit more. Trump got indicted over the January 6th stuff. I'm so happy. Oh, yeah, I heard about that, I think. Was that recent? Did that happen yesterday? I heard that happened yesterday. Or maybe I heard that he was about to be, and it hadn't happened yet. I don't remember. Anyway, yeah, that's fantastic news. I'm really glad to hear that, too. Um, federal charges. I, I love federal charges. The more, the better. In the case of Trump, I would really like to see state charges because he cannot weasel his way out of state charges. He can't pardon himself for state offenses for jurisdictional reasons. He can't pardon himself, period, but he's going to try to pardon himself for the federal charges either way. But he certainly can't pardon himself for state offenses. So the the Georgia stuff, I really want to see that play out. He's in a, he is in some deep shit for that one. Anyway, let's keep listening. Thanks for the super chat. I was voting in conclave to decide who the next vicar of Christ on earth will be. I don't know. I think, I think I'd like to hear a bit more shame about this. I think I'd like to see a bit more confrontation with the... Yeah, absolutely. With the, with the reality of the business. Now, this is a, a, a serious question, as I've said, and Whitakam very often rightly, in my opinion, attacks the climate of moral relativism. Again, Anne Whitakam is a, a member of parliament in the UK, so she's about as high up as it gets in UK government without being the prime minister or the king or queen or whoever else um, extremely influential and she is no fucking joke defending the catholic church seriously and if anything goes that can very well be the handmaiden of postmodernist hedonistic culture i very often i'm glad that she points these thing, things out but the rape and torture of children is not something to be relativized it's not something to be excused as a few bad priests. It's certainly not to be excused by the hideously false claim made by some Catholic conservatives that this wouldn't have happened if queers hadn't been allowed into the church. Yeah, simply disgusting. For the record, this is a few bad priests. That's what it is. There are a few bad priests out there who have done some bad things. And you know what? The Catholic Church as an entity as an institution, defended them, protected them, moved them from parish to parish to prevent them from facing accountability. Doesn't get more disgusting than that, man. I'm sorry to say that queerdom in the church is an old story too. Um, and it's worse, it's much worse than pornography and it's much worse than bad language on TV. And it's the crime that cries out for punishment. It's the thing that if we were accused of on this side of the house, we would die rather than admit. And if we were guilty of it, we'd kill ourselves. And it's the one thing the church has decided to excuse itself for under this papacy. The same euphemism comes 
in the term some Christians that is used in all the apologies about the, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, uh, the anti-Semitic pogroms and all the rest of it. It said some Christians fell into error. Some Christians allowed themselves to be, to be uh, uh, deceived in this way and to act against the gospel. Well, to, de to be deceived in this way. Some Christians allowed themselves to be deceived in this way. Thus shirking the blame off of yourself as the leader of the organization. If you're a leader in an organization, you are responsible for the things that happen in that organization, whether you like that fact or not. Guess what? The guy at the top, whoever that guy happens to be, guy, gal, or non -bi or I'm sorry, guy, gal, or non-binary pal, whoever it is at the top, sets the culture. They set the culture. So Bill Clinton takes advantage of his interns in the White House. That's setting a culture. Everybody all the way down the line from that point forward takes advantage of the people involved. Seriously, that's how it works. Bill Clinton, doing what he did with Monica Lewinsky, made a, a, a mess, you know? He created a problem for people. He took advantage of people, unfortunately, and all the way down the line, everybody else said, well, the president's doing it. Why don't I do it too? That's what happens when you have a scumbag for a leader. The people on the, like, all the way down the line view it as okay. And that's why it's so truly disgusting what Donald Trump did. Every step of the way, he took advantage of the system. He lied. He twisted things around. He tried his hardest to corrupt the shit out of every system that he was involved in all the way along the line that's why it was so disgusting what bill clinton did and what donald trump did that's why it's important that leaders are not scumbags and that's why it's important that you take responsibility as a leader for the culture that is set beneath you you are responsible for that culture. You formed it out. Whether you knew it or not, whether you knew any of these people or not, they are doing exactly what you do. If you're taking advantage of women, you can bet your bottom dollar that the other people in your organization, your agency or whatever, are also taking advantage of women or children or whatever. So the Pope pointing at other people and saying they're guilty and I apologize for their guilt not good enough for me i don't want an apology for their guilt i want an apology from you for setting the culture to be one where you are exonerated from all wrongdoing and it was just a few bad apples no that's not how it works take responsibility for your role in this Anti-Semitism was preached as an official doctrine of the church until 1964. Do you think that... Anti-Semitism preached as an official doctrine of the, ter of the church till 1964. 64! That was 20 years after World War II ended. That's crazy. It might have something to do with public opinion in Austria and Bavaria and Poland and Lithuania that the, the Jewish people were accused collectively as a people of deicide, of the crime of the murder of God in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. And that, that anathema on them was not lifted until 64, well after the uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust had stood trial in secular courts and been rightly punished for their actions. I'm sorry. Of the Holocaust had stood trial in secular courts and been rightly punished for their actions. How can this church say it has any moral superiority? It has difficulty catching up to what ordinary people regard as common moral and ethical sense. And it's absolutely a hundred percent. It has tr like, here's the thing about the Catholic church. This will be my parting blow for this right now. 
It's a conservative institution, not just the Catholic Church. Every religious institution, by and large, has acted as a conservative institution, a group of people that have believed that the old ways are better. Every time we've attempted to make things better for various different groups of people in one way or another, improving human rights or whatever, there's the church standing in the way. There's the church watching, waiting, looking for an opportunity to throw a wrench into what you're doing to prevent people from genuinely making things better for other people all the way along the line since time immemorial the church of any sort the catholic the methodist church the protestant church in general for some reason they've always found a way to hold back progress that's what it's always been about since day one with the church because therefore quote unquote traditional values i don't give a shit about traditional values you know what i give a shit about human rights i care about people having the ability to live their lives freely and equally without being attacked or maligned or mistreated or whatever i want equality not traditionalism i couldn't possibly care less i can't express to you how little i give a shit about traditionalism it means nothing to me what means something to me are human rights that's what it's about anyway let me know what you think about christopher hitchens and his take on this his opening statement is fascinating unfortunately i have to go because i have a doctor's appointment but you can bet we'll be covering this soon in the next part uh, which may be coming up immediately. I may not even be switching videos. Hell, this may be the same video, depending on how long I've been covering this. I'm trying to make my parts about an hour long. But anyways, uh, yeah, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, Lesbian Official, I really love your stuff, Owen. You inspired me to question my Christianity and, I f and figure out my religious path. I am now beginning to partake in Shintoism. Okay, great. That's fantastic. I analyzing... Your religious path is all I ask. If that path happens to be religious by the end of it, great. I'm fine with that. I just want you to be aware of the real history of the Catholic Church and all of the others and understand the propaganda techniques that are used against you. That's it. If you've found peace in, if you've found peace in Shintoism, good. I'm glad to hear that. Anyway, let me know what you think about this in the comments. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate uh, you guys coming and giving this a listen.